When John Aykroyd was a young man, his family placed an ad in the local newspaper for some Labrador puppies they had for sale. In a police interview years later, an acquaintance who showed up to look at them described a horrifying scene. He said he walked in to find puppy body parts scattered across the yard. Aykroyd had hacked the entire litter to death with a machete, saying, These are my dogs, and nobody's going to get them. The only thing between more innocent people being murdered and him running free was us. Who knows what he would have gotten away with? How many other people would have died at his hands? That's where I have issues about, you know, the not knowing. He went to the grave with a lot of secrets. Where's the justice in all this? We don't get to know where she's at. How's this right? Was he an evil guy? Hell yeah, he was. Did he deserve to die in prison? Yeah, he did. And hopefully he's enjoying his time in hell. I know this road, like the back of my head. Same with the stations, only half them back. Farms and truck stops, fireworks stands. I know this road, like the back of my head. By June of 1992, the task force investigating John Aykroyd had pivoted from the case of Aykroyd's missing stepdaughter, 13-year-old Richanda Pickle, to the 1978 murder of Kay Turner, for which he had long been the prime suspect. Two young women who were recent acquaintances of Aykroyd's, Melissa Sanders and Sheila Swanson, had also recently disappeared. The walls were closing in on Aykroyd. getting started. You know, this is the first step. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. It's just an accumulation at this point of a lot of uh, hard detective work that's been done by a lot of different agencies to, to get it to this point. Aykroyd and another man, Roger Beck, are charged with kidnapping, raping, and killing Kay Turner. That June 12th, John Aykroyd was finally arrested, along with his friend Roger Dale Beck. Beck had been with Aykroyd the day Kay Turner disappeared but was largely ignored in the original investigation. More than a decade had passed since Kay's killing, and there wasn't much new physical evidence to uncover. But in Beck, the task force saw a potential suspect. They took a fresh look at him and found a gold mine of new information. Beck, initially, he was an alibi witness. He was a friend of John's. They were guys that spent a lot of time together. We didn't think he was really that, the, one of the main players. You know, we thought Aykroyd killed her maybe on the way down, went to Beck's house, and they went out and they established this alibi thing. Investigators interviewed Beck's family members and began hearing variations of the same story, that Beck had spoken many times over the years about taking part in Kay's murder, sometimes even bragging about it. They interviewed his sister. She had picked up Beck once or twice when he got drunk in a bar and couldn't drive home and picked him up and he was crying and made some statements about how they killed this girl. And you knew Roger, right? He was yeah. basically your brother-in-law, right? Right. Yeah. See, Roger went around bragging about it all the time. And he threatened Pam and he goes, well, why would he be threatening Pam and threatening his kids saying, well, I don't just get you just like I did that girl up there and scatter you all over the country. There was a guy there, I don't know if it was Pam's brother or brother-in-law or something. He had some statements that Beck made. They were leaving. He said, we got to go up on the mountain and see John get our story straight. Pam was Beck's ex-wife, Pam Ramirez. She had originally provided an alibi for both Beck and Aykroyd for the morning Kay was killed, 
but had divorced him and moved to California in the years since. It became obvious we needed to interview Beck's ex-wife. So we planned a meeting to California. That's when it really opened up. The famous quote was like, I lied like hell. When Beck and him returned that day that she disappeared, they had blood all over them. He had her burn his clothes in his brand new boots. Both had blood on them and they didn't have a deer like they were supposed to have. It became very clear that um, Beck was a part of it that day and that she actually knew that he was a part of it and covered it up. But she was very afraid of him, and for good reason. She was afraid too until after they got a divorce. Mm -hmm. And then she decided to tell the truth. She has told us that you talked to her a couple of days after the gal was missing and told her that she had to lie for you. I for never you told her nobody to lie for me. Okay, and you're certain about that? Yes. That you've never had that conversation with me? No. And Roger Beck, uh, he's kind of a busy guy too, isn't he? Oh yeah, he's, he's the one you've been to day one. Okay, now we've told you also in the past that we have talked to people who've said that he told them that you and he killed a lady that was jogging. Yeah, that's what you say, but like I told you, you know, I did not kill nobody. With no way to know exactly what had happened the morning of Kay's murder, investigators came up with a novel idea. They decided to recreate and videotape different scenarios based on the little information they did have. They asked deputies and detectives to play Kay, Aykroyd, and Beck, found a truck like the one Aykroyd drove in 1978, and met at Camp Sherman in the winter of 1992. They couldn't use the videos as evidence, but the exercise helped investigators test theories on how Kay's abduction might have happened and humanized a woman none of them had ever known. I was basically the same physical height and build and looked a lot like what Kay looked like at the time she was killed. They just had me jogging down the road, um, filming, and they would have uh, Ackroyd's vehicle approach me. Only difference is, is I knew what was coming and she didn't. It was just basically two days of repeating a scenario over and over until we got it right or um, adding a new little twist to it where um, they had gained control over her a different way. Will McAnulty was lead detective on this case, and he's a bear of a man with a heart of a teddy bear. He said to me, let's film this one more time, and this time I want Kay to win. And in the last scenario, I was able to take the, the gun away, and I shot him. It was empowering to be able to pull it away from him and and put him down. I wish Kay would have had the chance to do that. Ackroyd's trial began in August of 1993. Prosecutors had plenty of circumstantial evidence, but physical evidence was scarce. They had little more than what was found in 1979, a few bones, what was left of Kay's clothes, and her Timex watch. She wound her watch and timed every single run that she ever ran for years. The watch wouldn't have just run down when she was running. Kay's watch offered a chance to prove the date and time she was killed, establishing that she had died the same morning she disappeared when Aykroyd admitted to stopping and talking to her would further tie him to the scene of the crime. Timex, you know, they take a lick in and keep keep on ticking. I mean, that was a perfect example of that. The Timex guy, he was the designer of this thing. He was R&D on this watch. They had a stem that pulled out, you know, you could, and you wound it. And he testified basically that the only two, only three ways that the watch could have stopped were it ran down, and we pretty much eliminated that. Or the stem gets pulled out. So you can pull it out and you can wind it up without changing the time. Or it can, it can, if it has a really substantial blow that exceeds the shock limits of the watch, it'll stop. 
So basically, I mean, our pitch was, yeah, either by grabbing her or pulling off her shirt, that stem got pulled out somehow. And so we were actually able to prove that the watch would still run, and it was on AM. So it, it was exactly the time she would have been there, and it had the 24 on it as well. So it was the right date. With the time of her death established by the watch, investigators sought to determine the cause of Kay's death through what little they had of her remains. But not much had ever actually been found. Much of what Ackroyd claimed to have discovered in 1979 turned out to be animal bones. The only two bones that were identified as human were the only two bones that could identify her, the mandible and the skull, which were separate. Those were the only two that were found. Prosecutors took what they did have, as well as what was left of Kay's clothes, to a U.S. Fish and Wildlife lab in Southern Oregon for analysis. We never really had a definitive idea how Kay had died. There were no bullet casings found, there were no bullet fragments recovered or anything like this. Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, had just built that really sophisticated lab in Ashland. And it had just opened. And they were happy to get something to work on. With their techniques, they could show that this fabric was cut rather than torn. Their panties and her shorts had been cut off of her rather than just getting ripped up by a coyote or something. The evidence of cut clothing bore a striking similarity to both Marlene Gabrielson's rape and Karen Lee's disappearance. But the analysis revealed even more. There were knife stabs through her shirt, and they found some lead fragments on her shirt where she'd been shot. So now we have an idea how Kate was, was killed, and all of a sudden it's like the light bulb went on. Both Ackroyd and Beck had made some statements, I think, at least Beck had, about being stabbed and shot. So that corroborated those statements that he had made. It was an enlightening experience when all of a sudden we got, wait a minute, <laughs> we've been looking at these things as terrors all this time, but in reality, they're not. These are wounds. And that was a big piece of the puzzle that was always missing. General Doug Dawson used graphic discussion about Turner's fatal wounds to try and prove that the only way Ackroyd could know how she died, as he said he did in previous police interviews, was because Ackroyd was indeed the killer. She was shot and she was stabbed. The odds of correctly guessing that are astronomical. Ackroyd's defense hinged on the idea that he was simple-minded and had become confused by police during his various interactions with them. His lawyer offered a theory that it wasn't Kay Turner, but a different runner he had encountered that morning, and that he had conflated the two as a result of the extensive news coverage that had followed Kay's disappearance. There were two runners, so there was some confusion, but that was basically his thing, was it was the wrong runner. That's when I was avidly running, um, and um, I just got up whenever I got up and put my clothes on and go for my run. And that afternoon, I had to go to the store for something, so I went to the store, and that's when we saw search and rescue people were. And so I remember asking, what's going on? And they said, oh, you know, somebody was out running today, and she hasn't returned. And I remember just thinking, oh, man, you know, and then just went home. For me, to really, really connect it, it wasn't until during the trial when I had to go and um, just say, yes, I was the other person running. Because a lot of, the, you know, they'd either describe her or me. If Morris saw Kay or Ackroyd on her run that Christmas Eve morning, neither registered with her as anything unusual. And there's no way of knowing if Ackroyd saw her. But a few months earlier, in August, Morris experienced a frightening encounter with a man on a different Camp Sherman road. I was working as a waitress at Black Butte Lodge for that summer, and we'd often ride our bikes. There were several of us that lived in the Camp Sherman area, so I was just riding back by myself, and I was off the highway, so I was on the road to Camp Sherman, and I was good enough at that time to bike ride without the handlebars, so, and I remember I still had my um, waitress dress on, I remember that, and there was a pickup truck 
car kind of just off the road and there was a person, a guy, you know, kind of moving around and stuff. And as I got closer, he went to the back of his pickup, comes out of the back of the pickup with the gun and he, and he, points, he points it at me, slowing me. And I was just about opposite at that point. And he was yelling something like, stop or come here or something. I can't remember exactly. And my mind just went, I'm going for it. So I just dropped down on my handles and <laughs> Pedaled like crazy, and then I weaved because I know it's harder to hit a moving target. And I remember just listening for the, you know, listening for the motor to start, but he didn't shoot, didn't follow. And when I got to the Camp Sherman Homes, um, I went all, I just went past and went to the store to report. That guy pulled a gun on me. It wasn't until years later, when she was called to testify at John Aykroyd's trial, that she would see the man again. I just remember looking at him and just going, that was the guy with the gun. Yeah, that was him. That's when it really hit me. That could have been me. That could have been me. There never was any physical evidence to prove Aykroyd's guilt. But the jury heard the tapes of voluntary interviews he'd given to police after Rachanda's disappearance, which contained numerous lies and contradictions. not only contradicted his statements in earlier interviews, but was simply impossible. In reality, Kay's remains had been scattered by scavengers, and her skull wasn't among what Aykroyd claimed to have found in 1979. Kay's skull wasn't discovered until 1980, when a hunter stumbled across it about a half mile away. To the jury, when taken as a whole, the taped interviews were almost as good as a confession. The verdict is in. After just four hours of deliberations, a jury tonight has reached its decision in the trial of John Arthur Aykroyd. The jury found Aykroyd guilty on all counts, two counts of aggravated murder and three counts of murder. Aykroyd was convicted this evening of killing Kay Jean Turner as Turner was jogging on Christmas Eve in Camp Sherman almost 15 years ago. You know, I feel like justice has been served, but it's not like the total weights off your back. I mean, maybe it's just going to be there. I think it, um, you know, the good guys won. And uh, kind of restored my faith in the system. <clears throat> that it does work. You know, you, you do what you can. But it was a very important, maybe one of the most important things I've ever done in my life, is helping get him off the streets. You just don't know how many lives might have been saved. It saved women's lives. If he'd stayed out, if he had never been convicted, he and maybe Beck would have done more crimes and killed more women, for sure. You know, he managed to get through that whole thing without ever getting caught. That was the only time he's ever been arrested or charged with anything in his life. Not because he was all that smart, but he managed to do it. How did Aykroyd manage to do it? He was an opportunistic killer who preyed on women who were vulnerable and exposed. A runner on an empty road, a child who feared him, two teens adrift in the world. There were no witnesses and no physical evidence, but there had been an unmistakable warning sign. Before he was ever suspected of being a killer, Aykroyd had raped Marlene Gabrielson in the woods outside of Sisters. She went to police, and they dismissed her as a liar. Aykroyd knew he'd gotten away with rape. He even laughed about it. He used the cover of Highway 20 to stalk women who were alone, 
and counted on society's blind eye to marginalize people to avoid prosecution for decades. Killing the right kind of people in the right kind of place during the right kind of time was all it really took. By 2010, Ackroyd had been in prison for almost 20 years. The potential for him to become eligible for parole was on the horizon. Kay Turner's murder was the only one Ackroyd had been tried for, and Richanda Pickle's case was still technically open. Detective Mike Harmon began to pursue its resolution. They used to say, in cold cases, time was your friend, because relationships change. But at a certain point, um, Time is no longer your friend. If we don't find her body, we're not gonna have any additional evidence. So is this case prosecutable now? One of the things that, that kind of influenced the prosecution was that, that John uh, was eligible to put in for parole. And one of the things we did not want is John Arthur Ackroyd to be released from prison. Mike told me, he's like, you know, I. I don't want to sound cold, but I don't want that son of a bitch out. And if I got to use your sister as a tool to keep him in there, I'm going to. I don't want this guy out. And I agreed with him. Yeah, absolutely. This guy cannot get out. The ultimate goal was, especially for Byron, Rashonda's brother, was to get Rashonda back. I knew it was going to be a long, hard road because Mike was very open going that he's not admitting to this. He's like, you know, I'm hoping with you being there through this process that, you know, maybe as a last living testament that he has, you know, where he could actually feel good about himself, that, you know, where is she? You know, sometimes in, in ex, if somebody's approached, it's in a facility like this with an opportunity to, you know, whether it be, you know, get out and spend Thanksgiving or Christmas with their family, in exchange for showing us the location of a body, that can be done and that can be arranged. Well, you know, back when I was arrested, they approached me with a deal. I'd serve 20 years total if I confessed to Kay Turner and Channy. Mm -hmm. Like I told my lawyer, I would confess in a heartbeat if I did either one of them. So you don't know where she's at? Is that what I you're wish saying? I knew. No, I think you do. No. The DA's office had to decide whether to bring Ackroyd to trial after all this time or negotiate a plea deal. While the 2010 investigation had turned up new information, like the fact that Richanda had disclosed her sexual abuse by Ackroyd to friends, there was still no smoking gun. Officials consulted with Byron and tried to involve his mother, Linda, but she declined to make the trip from California. Byron had to make the decision alone. I asked him, I'm like, what's the new evidence? Because I was convinced there had to be new evidence because we went to a grand jury indictment and it passed, we were moving forward. Wow, there's gotta be a smoking gun. And when they re revealed to me that there was no smoking gun, that's when I called for a break and my wife and I was out there in the hall. I lost it. I'm like, gosh dang, I wish my dad or my mom was here. This is a big decision. Do we take the deal or do we push it and go to trial and have the chance of losing it all? I'm like, I'm gonna take the deal. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna gamble this guy getting away with it. All right, I'll ask you then, sir, how do you plead to the uh, single charge of the indictment which alleges murder, alleged to have been committed on or about July 10th, to 1990 in Lynn County, Oregon, where it's alleged that you did unlawfully and intentionally cause the death of another human being to it, Rashonda Lee Pickle, contrary to the statutes uh, and against the peace and dignity of the state of Oregon. How do you plead to that charge, sir? No contest. Find that the plea of no contest is made freely, knowingly, and voluntarily in all respects. I'll accept the uh, plea of no contest. John Ackroyd sitting there, he's looking forward. We did not make any eye contact. When I opened the door, he made a quick brief, and when he seen it was me, I'm the only 
one there connected to this. No support, pissed off. But at the same time, uh, it felt good at the same time, knowing that I actually seen, seen this through for Richanda, giving her a voice and all of it. The no contest plea meant that Aykroyd wasn't admitting guilt, but also wasn't denying it. It guaranteed he would die behind bars. The location of Richanda's body remained a mystery, and the plea was immediately sealed. The details remained secret until early 2017, when the Oregonian asked a judge to unseal them. I was under a gag order that I couldn't go to the media. Where's the justice in all this? That, you know, we don't get to know where she's at. I can't tell anybody about what's going on. How's this right? It definitely felt being victimized again. I was like, this, this fucking prick has more of a right than what we do. The Kay Turner and Richanda Pickle cases had now been resolved, and Melissa Sanders and Sheila Swanson's murders were eventually closed as well. Investigators Linda Snow and Ron Benson had uncovered new information, like the witness accounts of Ackroyd coming to the Sweet Home shop with bloody hands. They also confirmed that some items found near the teen's remains, like a used rivet and a beaded car seat cover, were commonly used by highway workers on the job. The investigators and the Lincoln County DA were satisfied that they had enough to prosecute Ackroyd, but taking the case to grand jury didn't seem worth the expense. Ackroyd was already locked up for good. I've talked to the DA and uh, she believes that this is something we could have put in front of a grand jury if need, need be. The costs of prosecuting our case would have been huge with no additional outcome. So he was gonna die in prison one way or the other. So just being able to say that we could, if we needed to, that was our end goal, was to get it to that point. In December of 2016, John Aykroyd died in prison. With him died the answers to many questions, leaving the unknowns to haunt his victims, their survivors, and investigators alike. When you first hear the guy's dead, you're thinking, okay, a monster's gone. But then you kind of have that sad, emotional moment where, you know, for Byron, she's, she's not around, and he doesn't have that closure. He has that closure to John's dead, um, but he doesn't have that closure to where his sister is. At least I got something. The families of these other victims, no closure. My heart goes out to them. I had to ask, is, can I, any way that I can go and talk to this man? And they said no. How old would you ask? <sighs> Do you remember? And I just wanted to look him in the eye and ask him if he did it. Did he remember it? Did he, you know? Then when I found out that he died, I thought, that's a right thing to do. I was just so, I figured I would be maybe at the end of this. That's what I wanted was to have something, but I'm not now, so. Sheila Swanson's brother, Bart, occasionally takes Highway 20 to visit the spot off Hayes Creek Road where his sister's body was found. I go up there, you know, to yeah. pretty much to uh, remind myself that I still haven't let it go. Let her know that I haven't let it go. Byron keeps photos of his sister from childhood and thinks of her often, telling his own children that they had an Aunt Richanda who they'll never know. You still have that photo? <laughs> I actually got a tattoo of it. You do? I do. Oh, is this your sister? <laughs> yeah. When did you get that? Uh, last summer. Last summer? Yeah. It's just, uh, didn't have any way to put it to rest. And, uh, it was a very big part of my life. And 
I just wanted to be able to have a celebration and stuff. You know, it's not a tattoo of hurt and shame, but it was of love that, you know, just try to get some closure somehow. Mark Foster has returned to volunteer police duty after interviews for this story rekindled a desire to protect his small rural community. You know, these things, you can't go through these kind of things without it having some impact on you too. So I just spent a lot of time out on this road patrolling and, uh, and just keeping an eye on the community. So maybe this year, I can just be out there and, and, if possible, prevent such a thing from ever occurring again. Bill Hanlon stayed in touch with Kay Turner's mother after the trial and knows how much it meant to her that her daughter's killer was finally brought to justice, something that never would have happened without his perseverance. To this day, he keeps Kay in his thoughts every Christmas Eve. I do a run every Christmas Eve morning. Kay Turner, yeah. I ultimately told, wrote her mother a Christmas card and told her I did that. She said that's the best memorial she could have. After the trial, the woman who um, was the presiding grant, uh, the presiding juror, her mother went out there and found her and said, I just want to tell you, the first time I saw you, you I knew you were the woman who would save my daughter's soul. The day before we went for the Beck sentencing, we had the whole uh, task force here. Her mother was here. She sat here and told stories about Kay Turner, her daughter. And that was very satisfying. Everybody was listening, you know. That was great. Yeah. Marlene Gabrielson grew up as a member of the Inupiaq people in Alaska, and she moved back there for a time after her rape, no longer feeling safe in Oregon. She eventually returned, but still struggles not just with the aftermath of the attack, but the knowledge that had she been believed, much of what followed might never have happened. I figured it was because I was nothing. I wasn't going to amount to anything. I was brown and I was ugly. So, you know, you're not gonna amount to anything. Don't think you are, you know? I think that's why I cowered so much back then. And you haven't talked about it with people in those intervening years. You're the first person. And you know what my first thought was? When I read that message, why would she care? Because that's the mindset I had with this whole thing from the gate. And that's what made me come. It was because there's someone that actually cared. You're the first and you're the only survivor. I know, which is a miracle. You know, I, and this makes me feel really good because there is a reason why I'm here. And I guess I am not that ugly, you know, I, and I'm not worthless. Marlon, we don't normally, we do not make really victims. That's just a policy. I just want to have a discussion with you just about including your... My name? Yeah, Marlene Gabrielson. In yeah. Your story. Marlene K. Gabrielson. I'm a newbie. I'm a strong woman. Every question and every breath, every exit leaves a little death in this way and memory. Wonder with the ghost of how we turn. Yeah, I know this road like the back of my head. Same with the stations on the FM band. Phones and truck stops and fire roads. I know this road like the back of my head. 